Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sound table, space two at the sound table. First and foremost, I want to welcome everyone here and thank you for coming uh, to this very special Atlanta Design Festival event. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into the introduction because that's why we're here, but this is Michael Chena. That's right. And uh, my good friend Stefan Cartenson. We wanted to bring Mike down. We're, we're, we're old friends and, and colleagues, and we thought it was time for Mike to come introduce himself to Atlanta. And on that note, Stefan. Over to me. Uh, so I have the first question for you, Mike. Uh, but I, I, think, I, I think this is more of a conversation, so I'm going to kind of use this as a, as a, as a kind of kick us into the conversation. So, you know, I remember uh, creating something and posting on Flickr many, many years ago, and I get a response from you, and it might have been like f four in the morning. So um, you are somebody that has crazy work ethic. Can you um, talk a little bit about that f from your career, from uh, you know, going back to uh, Test Pilot Collective, uh, True is True, uh, you know, back to the mid-90s? So you actually did something that was, at the time, was wildly experimental, where you posted a piece of art design every day. Yeah. And if you can talk about that a little bit and talk about maybe the state of the internet at the time, because that was pretty fresh. Hello, everybody. Um, there's a lot of questions in there. I think, um, where do you want to start? I think. Really, I mean, maybe we'll talk about true is true. So um, about uh, 2000, there was an application out called Flash. And uh, yeah, I know everybody's a big fan. Um, but it, it was really amazing because you could animate online uh, with relatively low load times. Um, and basically, when I got on it, I was trying to figure out how to exploit. When, usually when I get into anything, and that's why I like learning new things, is because I like flipping things around, like how can I exploit it? So what I did was, um, Flash was usually supposed to be this slow thing, but what I did is I used it very, um, s very slow. And uh, did I say slow or did I say fast earlier? You said, said fast. fast. Anyway. So it's supposed you to be like slow. this quick thing. So Flash is like a quick animation thing, usually for intro pages and whatever. And what I would do is I would just put a white screen up, but it would be a 10 minute animation that slowly faded to black, and then it would do something at the very end. So um, what I try to always do is challenge the medium of whatever I'm working in. And I like moving around a lot because I'm interested in a lot of different things. So I think that that's one of, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> There's so many questions. See, so tell us your story and the young people of the audience to describe the internet at the time. So yeah, the internet was just kind of the wild west and I think that that was what's fun about it. And that's what I like. I like when things are off and um, because that's when you can have fun because you don't know what you're doing and nobody else knows what they're doing. Well said. Uh, digging a little deeper into True is True, can you uh, maybe outline a little further what that project was and how long it ran for? Oh gosh, it's, it's still kind of running. Um, oh, it's not up right now, but um, yeah, it was, it was just a place for me to play. I called it uh, like an online sketchbook and it was not, not based on client work. And what's odd is that I would get client work from it. Like I did uh, the NASDAQ uh, scrolling uh, isn't that the is it the Wall Street? Yeah, the Wall Street uh, stock exchange. They hired the Dow me. Jones. To, yeah, yeah. So they hired me to do the, the clock ticker from it, and because they liked the slow, slow, I'd slowed things down, and so they were looking for somebody to do that. So I think that that's what's fun about it is that, you know, having your own point of view, and just having fun with it, and not thinking like you it has to be on trend or has to be like that. I think like. Whenever I see things going one way, I always try and go the, the other, other way. So I would post every day, and I wouldn't um, archive them. And a lot of times, it would be like you clicked on something, and then it would activate, or the, the action would happen 30 seconds later. So it was just to, 
create um, confusion somewhat, but it was also, you know, there was a lot of talk then, like the internet could be this commerce machine. And I was, you Imagine know. Imagine that. I know. <laughs> and, and so I was kind of trying to go ag against it. And, and all these big, uh, all the big companies of the time, all the startups were crashing. So it was a really tumultuous time. And I was trying to do something different. Now, around that time, this kind of dovetails, you and a partner had a company called You Work For Them, correct? We Work For Them. We Work For Them, At the time, sorry. and then it was uh, You Work for, the, for Them after that, yeah. Can you kind of brief us on when that started and what the purpose and function of that company was? We Work For Them st was a uh, design agency, and we started that, gosh, that would have been uh, about 2000 as well. And all the agencies were crashing around us, and we started a, a two-man uh, agency based on personal work and people whenever I would tell people that they would just like go uh, what are you doing and it was it was a, not a good idea but um, we got clients right away I think people are always uh, looking for a different point of view and we presented uh, our personal work as the kind of work that we wanted to do. What, what I had learned was that what you get the kind of work that you show. So we didn't show the kind of work that we didn't want to do. And then uh, what w you work for them happened because I had left a, c a place called Test Pilot Collective, which was a typeface uh, distribution. And I had all these typefaces and I s we saved up 10% of all our income and then started that uh, to sell my typefaces. Yeah. Cool. Uh, talk about the importance of self-publishing -pub a little bit. Because a lot of us designers, we work in an environment Gosh. where we accept paid work from clients. Yeah. But just talk about like the, the fact that you put something out there in the world that somebody sees and you, yeah. you know, it kind of grows work out of that self-published. I feel like a lot of people do that now. I think a lot of clients are really um, challenging. And so a lot of designers now are doing a lot of personal projects. And I feel that's really important um, because you can do something different. You can do whatever you want. Like I've been starting to draw typefaces again. Um, I'm always drawing typefaces, but I'm doing them for fun. Um, I usually do them for clients. but. I'm doing them on my own terms, and I think that it's a really important that you have, that you're able to express, um, have your voice, and establish that, because a lot of times clients will squash that voice, and I think after you get beat down so much, it's hard to um, have a good perspective, so I think play is really important. It's, it's, it's essential. What would you say the percentage of, of the, you know, play in your work uh, against kind of the paid work is? Would you say, in my case, it's maybe 70-30, 70, 30, 70 yeah. paid, 30%. Like, I use nights and weekends to kind of, yeah. you know, you exercise the superpower that you yeah. think you have. Well, so you're saying, uh, what, what's my ratio? Yeah, what would, what it, would it be that? It fluctuates. That, Sometimes yeah. it's 100% client work. I mean, if the work's coming in, to be honest, I take it. So if I have a client, you know, coming with with a decent budget or it's highly creative, I'll, I'll take that. But what I've tried to do is try to make my personal work um, and my client work somewhat align with each other, which is very difficult. And, and things get off track real quick, you know. Uh, uh, there's some corporate work that I do. Um, I don't know if you'll see it, but I do a lot of branding. I've never shown it in my portfolio. So you're going to see a lot of logos behind me that um, I've worked on with agencies. So that's a big part of my, my practice is I get hired by agencies to be a sh sharpshooter of sorts. Um, I draw my own type. So... I'm, and I understand uh, branding pretty well, so I get hired by a lot of agencies, so I'm doing that a lot, but clients like Ghostly are, is, I see as personal work as well, so I've tried to incorporate that, but um, it just depends upon my mood and my feeling. I mean, sometimes life gets the best of you, and I don't get a paint that much or whatever, um, but I try to keep it 50-50, but... It's a tough one. Yeah. 
I'm really curious about the the, the paint aspect because yeah. you have you know design is kind of you know it's based on grids it's organizing yeah. it's taking the complicated and making it simple yeah and then you have paint which is the opposite yes you're taking the complicated you're making it more complicated it's yeah. organic it's free flowing mm -hmm. you know it kind of flows out of the earth like lava yeah but you're somehow able to use both and lock them up in a way that works yeah and that's a very rare thing to see. I mean, yeah. I usually either see like a very rigid Swiss design yeah. or I see somebody that is working very, f very fluently. Yeah. So how do you talk about how you make those two work? Because the tension that that creates, and I, I see that in a lot of your work with uh, Ghostly International, which yeah. is a, a really great record label mm -hmm. that you do a lot of work for. Yeah. So talk about that tension between the two, organic versus rigid. I think, um, well, first of all, when I went to college, I went to, I had a double major in design, it was called visual communication, and I also had a, a BA in fine arts. And I enjoyed both, and I, I think what I learned a lot about art was, as I sat, I, I went, a lot of my classes, I had a really good friend, and he was probably the best artist that I've ever seen. I mean, he could just sit and draw very realistically. And I always tried to draw with emotion. So for me, my work was always really grotesque, almost like an Egon Schiele. And my, it was crazy because I would get picked, my work would get picked. I always thought I was the worst person in the class, but my work would get picked to go in shows and, and actually some of it's in the, uh, some of my, my college uh, per permanent collection. But I have something in me that I'm very, um, I think we're all like this to some degree, but I have a very opposite sides of me. Like, um, I like very, I like rules and I like the grid, but I also like complete chaos. I like seeing when things just get blown to shit. And I think for me, it's, it's important to have both of those. They inform um, how I've tried to describe this before is like the brain has a neural network and the more connections that you can make between those opposite sides, the better um, you can express yourself. And so for me, what I'm trying to do is, is complete that web. And so whenever I see something that I don't know and I'm interested in, I try and get into it. Blow things to shit. Yeah. Talk about that. So, hey, so... <laughs> So here's something that I've observed about you, and just from talking to you, you seem to be, you, you go deep. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's art, it's design, it's cooking, it's whiskey, it's coffee. It doesn't matter. You seem to dive in and go deep. Uh, so is there a correlation between uh, all of these things? For example, music. Yeah. So jazz is a very records. rigid. Records. Yeah, Tell records. them about the records, We're, we're going to go to Tell that Tell them place. about the records. We're going to talk about records for the rest of the evening, so if you don't want to... <laughs> thank you for all for coming. We have a turntable turn ready to go next door. But, yeah. but talk about, like, because when I see your work, I see music in a way, in a sense that the, 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 the grid is the, is the, the per percussion, and then you yeah. have the various layers of, like, you know, freestyle on top of it, yeah. right? So... In your mind, when you sit down and you concoct these things, is that, is that something that is true? Are, are you I, thinking? I'm, I'm trying to make things that, I, I, that make me feel uncomfortable and that I haven't seen. If I feel like I've seen something similar to that, I don't want to do it. But um, as far as the, the interest things, is when I get interested in something, some of you probably are like this, is when... When I, want, when I want to find out about something, I dive deep into it. Like when I f first started painting with acrylics, I wanted to know how acrylics behaved and I wanted to know how to um, break them and how, how they can be exploited. So I was like doing things like fermenting um, paints and things like that and just doing weird things and so you made acrylic kimchi, basically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where the cooking comes in and, and things like that is like learning how to ferment foods and, and just paying attention. I think like I, when I, whenever I have interns, I just tell them to be interested in things. Just, just look, like pick a couple things like color, like for, 
for a month, I'll just notice color and I'll be paying attention to color. And then um, I'm always interested in type. So that doesn't, you know, I don't need to ever remind myself on that. But whenever I feel like I'm not, I, I'm kind of lacking in something, I'll try and just pay attention to it and maybe read about it. But yeah, I have an obsessive personality to some what, uh, some degree. I like that. Yeah. Which uh, brings us back to records. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But more specifically, the record work that you did for Ghostly. Yeah. So, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, this fascination with paint uh, yielded some very interesting album covers. Yes. And at a certain point, you branched off into a purely fine art endeavor as well. Yeah. Can you talk about how that process of, of segmenting the fine art from the graphic design happened? The, the fine art started again, like, well, so... If you look at my work from the late 90s to the early 2000s, I was drawing and painting back then. Um, and I stopped because I just started getting corporate work and I, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, so there was a gap for about 10 years and I think that's kind of like my cycle is 10 years. I, I usually uh, switch jobs every 10 years, I switch houses every 10 years. Um, it seems like that's a good cycle for me, but um, when I was starting to think that you work for them was not going so well, and I was not happy with running a business, I started drawing, I had insomnia, and I'm sitting here thinking, what can I do at 2 a.m.? That's constructive. Um, and I just started drawing again, and I would be watching, sometimes I'd be watching jazz documentaries, and so I'd be sketching John Coltrane, um, and then I would just sketch and just go, and then next one, just sketch. And I wasn't worried about doing it nice or whatever. I think that that's, um, a lot of people have that block where they think they have to do something well, and I think that that's a really wrong way to think about things. You should do things horribly. Um, and then, I think that's what's, what, what's interesting, right? I mean, when I see some young designer that's not following a trend and their shit's really raw and bad, that's interesting to me. I'm more interested in things that are done wrong than things that are done right. So, um, so I started sk sketching and then uh, there was an album for an, well, I, I had, to even back up before that, I had been making these brushes for because I was doing U work for them, so I was making these Adobe brushes, and I started making these brushes that were like, what could I replicate? Could I replicate how you paint, and could I could I make a brush stroke that was almost like a paintbrush, just a notch? And so I would made those, and so I did a painting. Um, just digitally, and then I did like this Roy Ayers portrait. Um, that was took his one of his album covers and kind of lined it up anyway, whatever um, And then I started doing it for real because I needed to to do an album cover and it was called body code and I had the back designed already and it was real stiff and geometric and I thought well, what if I did an organic because um, just of body and code organic not and so Yeah, so I did the front it was a painting and so it just was exciting. It felt right. It was a good. T it was a. It was a very um, fruitful period in my life. And when you decided to take the painting on the road, so to speak, and, and do it as a as an alternate or a simultaneous career, yeah, was it difficult to find people that would because yeah. you're a graphic designer by trade that would yeah. take your work seriously? It's very difficult. Like painters hate designers. <laughs> um, and I think I'd say that antipathy kind of goes both ways sometimes. Yeah, well, I but don't know. Is, is that changing though? I it's, feel changing, like it's changing absolutely, yeah. for sure, without a doubt. I mean, but it, it, but it's always, but design and painting has, I think, have always. Well, design is a new form. Um, so, but you yeah. have uh, who who just died? Uh, the the oh gosh, what's his name? Anyway, um, there is mm -hmm. a there's a painter that recently died. Uh, is Indiana, Indiana. Oh, yeah. Robert right. Indiana. Love, love. Man, his, his stuff is graphic design. He's a, he's a graphic designer, but he was also a fine artist. Sure. And he walked that line. And, and I think people like him are um, who I look up to. Exactly. Uh, there's Mac, tons Mac of people. Reed, uh, Andy Warhol. I mean, you know, there's a long list of... of a long list, but people, people don't... But, but the, 
the art world is another click like the des like the design world is so it's hard to get in there and you have to play the game and I don't like playing I really don't like playing games I don't have time for that shit so um, I would get uh, if, if a gallery asked me to do a show I would do a show but I'm not out there trying to get a rep I'm not out there to do all that um, I've had reps come and I've turned them down because I didn't think it was right fit and so I'm willing to say no because I like to keep the art precious and be fun. As soon as I have to do a gallery show, it's just not fun, you know? Um, client work is fun to me though because client work is under the assumption that I, I'm doing a service for somebody, but when I'm painting, it's for me. Right, that makes sense. So, uh, so why? Why graphic design? Why, why not just all go full art? Like you have full control of your output. What's, what is stopping? Fear probably, yeah. That, that, was, that was my thing too. Yeah, it's tough. Oh. You, you really have to play the game. I mean, there's people, and I, I, I hate to say, I, I probably shouldn't even say this, but there are really amazing artists out there um, there's a lot of shit out there too. And I think the, what frustrates me is that people don't have the discernment to understand what's a shit painting versus a, a good painting. Like I'm very um, into abstract expressionist work and I don't need to know who it is. I, don't, I can see a piece and it, and it speaks to me just like a Rothko. I mean, if you've ever seen a Rothko in person, um, that shit vibrates. It mm -hmm. it hits you. It has it has f energy that comes out of it. It's and hard to translate that into a, like a plate in a book. It really is. It is. Yeah. Like um uh like uh who's the guy that did the pointillism? He's on all the greeting cards. Um. Yeah. Uh, when you see his work in real life, you think, holy shit, he was a he was a badass. I mean, he is. It's punk rock. I mean, it's yeah. raw. And it's real, um, but when you see it on a greeting card, it it does it a disservice. And I think that that's, yeah, that's another conversation. I've got a tangent on that, Mike. So taking that analogy to the graphic design world, how do you feel about shepherding your work from like birth to execution? Like how are you are you hands on all the way when when possible? in terms of choosing materials and doing yeah. press checks and all that stuff? I can't do press checks and things like that, um, unfortunately. And every time I get something back, I make a snide comment about something getting fucked up. But um, yeah, and they hate me. Um, I'm very hands-on, but I've learned to kind of like, I think there's, there's a point of no return, like there's that five to two percent and I'm so busy that that five or two percent, I need I need to know when to cut cut it. Like I've been working on the Matthew Deere cover, um, the new one, and it's it's a longer story. It took a lot of twists and turns, but after at a certain point, I just went with my first. After you know six months of going all around, I went with my first idea, which was the best. And I think sometimes it's really important to explore a lot of different. Um, routes, but I think also sometimes it's um, it's not healthy, and when you do it, you kind of have to check yourself and say, "This is not productive. I need to do things differently." And so I could have had that project done six months ago, but I went down a rabbit hole. So I think, yeah, I mean, I'm a perfectionist, absolutely, but um, I also. I'm a realist, you know, like I don't, I don't want to kill myself, which I do sometimes. So how do you, how do you balance work and work in family life? So you have a family, yeah. Yeah. Uh, family therapy? <laughs> Gosh, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys laugh. Um, um, you know, they're all jobs. Really, it's all work, and what I'm trying to do is enjoy the bad times. I think that that's the hardest thing, is to enjoy when shit goes bad, and 
And I think that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds funny, but it's, I think there is a, a way of doing it. I mean, because like when my, my son is, you know, uh, my oldest son is, is, you know, the, I just, you know, he's the best thing, but he's also the most frustrating thing. But to, to know that like in 10 years, I'll wish that I could see him have a tantrum or something like that. To know and understand that, to wish that you could be, so to, to you know, like I think I read something today about a quote about like when you have pain, to focus in on that pain and to um, absorb it and to like learn how to relax and then go deeper and just keep on going with it. But I think there is there is something in that and usually when I'm, um, in a rough spot, I think that that's usually when the art comes, and I think that's uh, therapy, you know, and okay. so art is also used for therapy as well, as well as music. Yeah. So, a lot of my favorite designers, uh, they didn't finish school, they got kicked out of school. Yeah, uh, they were rejected, or you know, they were deemed not good enough, and then yeah. they become overachievers, and they are the stars of the design world. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I was um, when I went to college, I moved as far away from my parents as uh, possible, and okay. when I got into college, I was ready to go. And yep. I mean, I, when, in, even in high school, I was sneaking to clubs. So I learned how to DJ uh, my senior year of high school, which would have been 89. And I got into house music. And when I went to Dallas, I was ready, ready to enjoy. And I did. And I was a, a big DJ. And my design work suffered. I knew I wanted to be a designer. Um, I first thought that design and advertising was the same thing. That's how popular design was. Um, at the time, and I ended up dropping out of school to just DJ, and because I just really loved it. I mean, I was in Dallas at the time, and it was the heyday. I mean, when you hear about people talking about like the UK or Chicago, I mean, we were breaking into warehouses with uh, mobile systems and having 2,000 people parties. Um, it was amazing, and uh, the drugs were really good. <laughs> and um, in around I ninety, ecstasy was legal then. Ecstasy, mm. and they and the clubs used to make it in Dallas, in the clubs. Like a punch, ex punch. Like you walk in, they hand you a punch. There'd be bowls on the table, and that was after my time. Um, that was like the uh, there's a club. Um, called the Stark Club that was designed by Philip Stark. And when you said Grace Jones lived in Dallas, she did. She lived in Dallas uh, in the Stark Club, um, and and so we we came. I when I got there, I was going to the club just on accident. That um, was one of the clubs that was making the ecstasy, and that was illegal then. But I met a lot of the old gay DJs and things like that that would tell me stories about it, and. Um, so I just got in and they said, you know what, screw it, we're gonna just start. So it started with loft parties. They would uh, find a place like this and um, somebody would get it and the people would come. And um, so it developed out and, and yeah. So in 95, late 95, the, it just, things started just going wrong and I had to get out. Um, I was, I was, a little bit too wild, but so when I moved to Min I moved to Minnesota. I moved in um, to my parents' basement because I was broke as hell for college, and I just was 100% design. And I would work from 8 a.m. to 4 a.m. and I just got on online uh, first thing in '96 and learned how to HTML and program back then. Loading one image was insane. My first website was all text, <laughs> and I would go around to try and get jobs, and I would say I could design websites, and I'd say about 80% of the people would give me a blank stare when I said the internet. They would be like, 
what? And I'd be like, oh, I can design websites, whatever. And I um, probably went to 100 jobs, and I could not get a job. So I was working a uh, night shift at National Car... This is too much information. <laughs> but I had a shitty job, and I knew I wanted to get out of that job so bad. And so I just... I was like, I'm going to be a great designer, and I just put that work in. And, um, yeah. I eventually got a job at a nonprofit and um, quit and just went on my own. So the early days of the internet, yeah. uh, eyebrow raising internet, um, was full of some really interesting design concepts, a lot of them seemingly having no rhyme or reason. <laughs> You were one of the first designers that I remember really championing, you know, Reuter and Muller Brockman and so forth. How yeah. did you come across these guys? Because I know there was no Amazon. There were not a lot of Swiss design blogs you could just kind of no. casually leaf through. No, you you learned about the grid system, but you you uh, it was light. It was like Muller Brockman was in the background um, because. Uh, design was uh, American design was more more focused on client and the stuff that was going on in Germany and Switzerland and all that really was was fantasy land uh, over here um, but when I after I had dropped out of school I was uh, record shopping and I looked in the book section and I found a a, a, a meal rooters typography and I bought it and I remember just like thinking this is the craziest shit I've ever seen. Those in my were life. going for what, what, like around hundred dollars at the T time. Two hundred. <laughs> they were out of print. And they out were of print. Impossible you could, to find. You could not get them. So what I did is, so that was in '95 that I got a copy of that. But what I started doing was started to find uh, Mueller Brockman's grid systems because after you, you know, you, learning about music is was so important because reading the, the, the liner notes, oh, Roy Ayers played with uh, Jack Wilson. Who's this uh, Jack Wilson guy? So I would say, he, he would champion uh, Mueller Brockman. So I would say, who's this Mueller Brockman guy? And so I started looking for, uh, you know, back then you couldn't find anything, but, um, you know, the books were going for a lot of money, for about 200 bucks. So I found, I, I just by doing some uh, Google searching, I found there was a company called Neagly that was still pressing these books and I started ordering them. And I would, uh, my first order was for 10 copies and I would sell them to my friends for like five, you know, five bucks above cost. And um, my friends ate that shit up. I mean, I had people like, saying, hey, can you get me copies of that? I want to get, I want to get that book. And because I would tell my friends about it and they'd show their friends and then their friends would show their friends and it created this like um, really awesome thing. And so I was importing like 20 copies of these books. And um, one day um, I thought, well, I'm going to put them up online because I had started, uh, you work for them was to sell my typefaces. And I thought, oh, I'll order um, 20 copies maybe I'll sell them, you know, in a couple months or whatever. And I think they sold, it was either in two hours or two days. It was a very short amount of time. Um, and it just went from there. And so I just dived head on in and I said, I'm going to order from the Netherlands. I'm going to find books by Wim Crowell. I'm going to find all these, um, these guys that were my heroes. And I just started importing books and started selling them. And that's, and yeah. 